So uh, we are moving into our next session, which is going to be moderated by Nee Irwin with the Washington Department of Ecology. And I will invite her in in just a sec. Hello, Nee. Um, this is kind of the second of two sessions that has this theme of looking at where is the excellence happening in terms of our work to prevent, prepare for, and respond to spills in this transboundary region. Um, this particular session is going to be a focus on programs and plans. And we have a lineup of some really amazing speakers. And Ni nee Irwin is going to be moderating this panel. So with that, Ni, nee, I am handing the virtual baton over to you. Great, thank you for the introduction, Hillary. Um, hello, everyone. I'm happy to be back today. Again, my name is Ni nee Irwin. I'm with the Washington State Department of Ecology Oil Spills Program. Um, I'm happy to be moderating this session. Um, it's on the work that has been done to ensure excellence in the transboundary spill prevention, preparedness, and response environment. Um, the speaker today is going to be covering what is in place, what might be missing, and what are the gaps in the transboundary realm. Um, while we are not the only shared borders between the U.S. and Canada um, and Mexico, we certainly share a particular unique and amazing environment between Washington and British Columbia. Uh, Cross-border spills are uh, very complex. Essentially, you are required to duplicate efforts on both sides of the border. And so that brings up a lot of challenges. And so how can we be successful at some of these cross-border responses to major oil spills? Um, some key points and things that will be covered today um, is that we need an alignment of plans and exercises that will probe into the plans, searching for areas of improvement. Um, we need tribes and First Nations to bring their concerns, their knowledge, and their resources to bear. We also need to, as much as possible, al align our laws and regulations. Certainly, we have to ensure that our equipment systems are compatible as well as having the ability to move people and equipment across the borders without delays. And probably more important than ever is to manage public communication. We need to do it early, we need to establish uh, trust, and we have to have consistency in messages. So those, these plans and activities that you're gonna be hearing about today from our speakers will, is about putting place in those agreements, making the connections, and ensuring that our systems are compatible in order to set that groundwork for communication. You'll be hearing from Jillian Oliver, who is the Deputy Superintendent Environmental Response with the Canadian Coast Guard. She is speaking um, the, about the Canadian Coast Guard's work with Indigenous nations around the environmental response planning, training, preparedness, and she'll cover some information on the Wanda Fuca Integrated Plan. You'll also hear from Christine Gatsky, uh, she's a referral coordinator for the Pachadat First Nation. She is speaking on the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding with the Canadian Coast Guard that will, that will see the construction of a multi-purpose marine safety center on the southwest coast of Vancouver Island. You'll also be hearing from Linda Pilkey Jarvis from the Washington State Department of Ecology. She is speaking on the Wanda Pika Geographic Response Plan. And last but not least, Todd Woodard, Director of Natural Resources for the Samish Indian Nation. He is speaking on the work that the Samish Nation are doing to prevent and prepare for oil spills. Um, we have one hour for this session and we're fortunate to have four speakers, but that means that they each have 15 minutes for their presentation and we probably won't have too much time for our Q&A. We'll try and fit that in, um, but I really encourage you to please put your questions in the Q&A and the speakers will address those um, during uh, the time they're not speaking. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, up first will be Jillian um, Oliver. Jillian, I will start your presentation. Great, thanks, Ni. Um, so are you gonna bring up the presentation or there it is, okay, perfect. So hello, everyone. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging that I am speaking to you today from the traditional territory of the Seashell Nation over in Seashell, British Columbia, Canada. Um, as me said, my name is Jillian Oliver and I'm the Deputy Superintendent of Environmental Response for the Canadian Coast Guard. I'm based out of uh, Sea Island, just outside of Vancouver. And next slide, please. So I'm just going to run over um, an overview of sort of how the response system works within Canada. 
and uh, highlighting the ongoing preparedness activities, and then trying to put that in context with a uh, bit of a scenario. Next, please. So in terms of preparedness, um, we've really been focusing the last couple of years on building uh, area response plans, as well as um, upgrading our equipment, uh, working on response training and collaborative exercises. Next. So in Canada, this is the system we have for environmental response. The, so at the top of the, the triangle here is our national policy and that's outlined by Transport Canada. So that's a different department, but they set the policy, they're the regulatory overseer. And the next level down, we have our national contingency plan. So that is part of Canadian Coast Guard, a national contingency plan for environmental response. And um, as, as well at the national level, we have the CanUS PAC joint contingency plan. So that's between the Canadian Coast Guard and the United States Coast Guard. Below that, we have a regional contingency plan. So in the Western region, that encompasses the area all the way from British Columbia and the next three provinces over. So Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba for navigable waters there. Um, and the, the way, place I'm gonna highlight today is this uh, green part of the diagram, the Canadian Coast Guard area plans. So those are depicted on the map there and there are eight of them. Um, I'll get more into that in a little bit. And below that, we also have local plans. So these are anything from geographic response strategies, um, either First Nations territorial plans, uh, community scale plans, uh, oil handling facilities, different plans that uh, may exist within different parties. Next, please. As I mentioned, we do have a national plan um, that covers Canadian Coast Guard, US Coast Guard. Um, and within that plan, there are annexes. So the Can US PAC annex is the one that covers the territorial waters in between British Columbia and Washington State. Next. <clears throat> so back to that green part of that uh, triangle I was talking about, our area response plans. Um, these plans, as, as the diagram depicted, uh, fall under that hierarchy of other plans that exist. We also, uh, in these plans, what we try and do is we have spelled out sort of the alerting notification procedures and identified the steps that we have in place for activating a coordinated response with all other response participants. Um, and I'll get into how those, how those uh, conversations happen. Um, but another piece that we're working on, and this is continual improvement, is the appendices and annexes. Um, so including any new content that um, the participants bring up uh, that we want to specify and have things available ahead of time so that we're not scrambling at the time of an incident. And finally, these area plans, um, I think the, the best part is that they're meant to be evergreen and continually updated. So um, right now we're working on an annual cycle where we meet with uh, all the different parties and then at the end of the calendar year, we would update for the, that version of the plan. So right now we're working off the 2020 plans and I'm, I can provide you with links to those later. Next. So these are the planning areas. It looks to be quite dark here, but the most pertinent one here is the number seven down the bottom. Hopefully you can see my cursor. And this is perfect, thank you. Um, this is the Juan de Fuca area plan. Um, but like I say, there are eight other plans covering the British Columbia coastline. And next. So who's involved in these plans? We're trying to bring in everyone who would have a, a role or who would participate in a response, an environmental response incident um, from a ship source pollution. And so um, Canada Coast Guard is leading these plan developments. Um, who also is involved from the federal side is the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Transport Canada, uh, nations involved in those planning areas, anyone whose territory is there, um, province of British Columbia. So primarily that is um, 
the oh, what's your new name? So, uh, <laughs> um, not Flynnro, not EMBC, but emergency management and climate change. Um, so, but we do also speak with emergency management and Flynnro. So, um, there's various people involved in depending on the the area. As well, we invite municipalities, uh, industry, so people like the response organization. So um, in British Columbia, that we only have one certified response organization, which is Western Canada Marine Response Corporation. Um, if there's a port in that planning area, they're also invited. And stakeholders, so key stakeholders, NGOs, um, anyone who may have a, a vested interest or a, part, a role to play in a response. Next. Um, so what are we doing to develop these plans? First off is we establish a working group. So we reach out to these different participants that I just outlined and try and identify who are the key um, people we should be speaking with. Um, then we come together and try and figure out what, what we want to have in these plans. So is there an area that we need to, um, to clarify, to work on, to, to get some sort of templated material perhaps that would be um, of use in an incident. So some things we try and build is just a common understanding of the, the way we all come together and how we activate a coordinated response. So um, identifying you know, incident command structure and how that happens, um, as well as trying to facilitate the collection of different data and ensuring that we can all bring that together in a format that will be compatible. So a lot of work happening um, with Indigenous nations in terms of um, cultural areas of concern and uh, also just uh, sensitivity. Um, a lot of work happening on, from Department of Fisheries and Oceans and identifying um, marine sensitivities. Environment Canada is also doing a lot of work on migratory birds. So having this information all available and in a one place where we can access it when need be. Next. Another part of preparedness, like I said, is equipment caches and location of personnel to respond. So this is a map, it's, uh, it's ongoing um, being updated because we are also working. Uh, we have right now in Port Hardy, we also have a depot going in. Um, I believe Christine's gonna talk to you about what's happening on the um, southern tip of Vancouver Island there, um, the western side. And we currently, just in case people aren't aware, we do have a response depot in based out of Richmond, the Vancouver area, as well as Victoria um, with uh, staff personnel. We also have a emergency operations center 24 seven that operates out of Victoria. And that links into our notification process. Um, we also have caches of equipment uh, located throughout the coast. Um, and as I said, the, some of those caches are being updated with um, part of an equipment modernization project. On top of the equipment here that Coast Guard has, uh, the response organization also has um, their bases and equipment located throughout the coast. I haven't got those up here, but um, I believe you can access those on the Western Canada Marine Respo Response Corporation website. Next. So how are we trying to link this together? As Ni nice said, um, we see it as being a, a three-part process for preparedness. So planning, training, and exercising. So what we're looking to do is to try and get the right people in the room, develop plans, and then uh, train together, and as well conduct exercises together. And then hopefully the lessons learned from those two um, experiences will then inform additional areas for improvement in the planning process. And that's the cycle uh, that we're working off of now. Next. So for the training side, uh, Coast Guard does deliver some environmental response training. Uh, we have, they deliver it internally to our own department, as well as we invite uh, Indigenous nations, other agencies and uh, community members. Unfortunately, due to COVID, um, all in-person training is on hold right now. Um, we are developing, we're working on developing a virtual course to try and keep some of that going and um, being able to offer that in the near future. Next. 
So what do we try and do in the training? We're trying to develop a common understanding sort of of oil properties, fate and behavior, persistent versus non-persistent hydrocarbons. Um, again, we're working to increase the incident command system knowledge and, and response system on how we come together and just really building the, working on the relationships. So with indigenous nations and other response participants so that we're not meeting each other for the first time under a, a really um, high stress incident situation. We know who each other are. We can, um, we know what roles we're gonna play and how we're gonna come together. Next. So exercising is another big piece. Uh, this is a, a couple of photos of an incident command system from one of our exercises. Uh, as you can see, it gets pretty large, um, but really playing these out and getting together and, and trying to simulate a real life situation is invaluable and like I say it develops those lessons learned and and ways that we can improve our ability to respond. So everyone is invited to these. We are um, trying to make them collaborative, uh, have the right people there so that they get that experience. Um, we do have an exercise coming up uh, next week I think um, that is a Canada-US joint exercise. Um, because we do have, a, as part of that CAN-US PAC agreement, we do have exercises uh, annually one, um, in the US and in Canada. Because of COVID though, we have had to really downsize how that looks this year. Um, it was meant to be a really large major incident. We had planned prior to COVID um, that would have involved all the, uh, the five governments of Canada, US, Russia, Korea and Japan, and that was going to take place. Um, that all got called off due to COVID. So now we are going with a just a virtual exercise um, from Canada and US and inviting key people to that virtual forum um, where we can play out sort of international coordination and uh, indigenous involvement in the response. Next. This is a photo depicting uh, some of the training. So just use use of a skimmer, getting people um, to see how it works and some of the issues about operations. Okay, got the three minute sign. Next. So I'll just try and put that in context of what all happens by imagining a, a, a ship, a hypothetical cargo ship traveling into the Wanapeak Strait. Um, next. We would receive that uh, a distress sign either from our 1-800 number 24 seven or through our marine communications and traffic services system. Uh, we could also receive it through BC's emergency call line next. Upon hearing that we would then do an assessment and mobilize um, uh, assets, we would uh, reach out to everyone involved by letting them know of the situation. So that would be both, we have an MOU with um, BC EMBC who also notifies a variety of people, but we Coast Guard personally would notify the US Coast Guard uh, based on our agreement in Canada US PAC. We would be notifying key um, other partners, federal partners who are involved in a response to get sort of trajectory information, sensitivity information, as well, um, all the First Nations involved in the planning area, so the one the planning area. Next. Uh, a couple assets we have is this, what we call the NASP plane. You may have seen it, bright red plane that has um, out there pretty much daily looking for pollution on the water. Um, you see that flying overhead, that's what it's doing. And they report back to us to give us that um, eyes on the scene. Sometimes, you know, you can see a lot more from a few hundred feet up than you can on the water. So that next screen will give you a little example of what that looks like. Sometimes they can, they can, or they can um, sort of trace where, what they're seeing and um, give calculations on estimates of what the quantity of fuel. Next. Two other assets we've recently added that I think are really enhanced our ability are these emergency tow vessels. So we have two of them. They are situated um, strategically in the northern and southern parts of British Columbia. So to enable uh, 
uh, most timely response based on where an incident may happen. Um, this is a huge resource for us and we are happy to have it. Next. Uh, so a lot of, like I said, the sensitivity information comes from Environment Canada through their National Environmental Emergency Centre. And what they have is um, a store of all the sensitivity data, the shoreline mapping. Um, so they give that to us. I won't get into who's involved in the environmental unit, but that's who it is. Next. Um, yeah, so they provide this data to us. Just trying to rush through so we can get through. Here's a picture of some of that information. So habitat, sensitive habitats. And again, the next slide shows another depiction of the shoreline mapping sensitivity information, for example. And this is just a summary of some of the things that have been in place over the last couple of years that we're working on to improve our preparedness. And that is it. Great, thank you so much, Jillian. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, invite you to look at the Q&A. There seems to be a few questions up there. Um, so if you could take time to see if you can address those and we're gonna go ahead and move on to um, the next presentation. And sure. so I invite uh, Christine um, to come on and I will get your presentation up here. And Christine, you're ready to go. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. I am not sure I tried to turn the video on there. I have very poor connection out here in Port Renfrew. So I was just gonna say hello, but uh, I'll let the pictures do the talking for me. Um, so if you can see me, I am waving. Hello, everyone. Um, to put a face to the name, uh, I wish I I wish I could use technology a bit better, and and hopefully, with the uh, Coast Guard station coming here to Pachidat, that will be one of the many advantages for the nation and the region of improving communication. So, we've been looking forward to that, especially in the context of of the COVID world. Um, but uh, I wanted to thank, thank everyone and thank the organizers for the invitation to speak today on, on behalf of Pachidat. Um, my name is Christine Gatsky. I'm refer referrals coordinator for the nation and work very uh, much with focus on, on the marine territory and the many different uh, changes to the marine territory and advancing marine jurisdiction here in Canada and transboundary. We always look forward to these events uh, and are strong advocates for the transboundary work. Uh, they seem to be few and far between having the time to all come together and, uh, and work as one and work without a border as, as things were done traditionally. And uh, last year's presentation with the uh, other nations and tribes on the Indigenous Caucus was very important to this transboundary work and we hope to advance that collectively um, and other events to come. As I understand, this is the last year for this event. So Pachidat is New Chanos, sharing the history and family ties with Ditidat to the north or to the west, excuse me, and Makah to the south. And Nichanoth means all along the mountains and sea and is ocean facing and just important to kind of orient uh, the direction to the ocean and the ocean resources and, and territory. We're located on, on the west coast of Vancouver Island in Port San Juan near the settlement of Port Renfrew. And uh, the main community site resides at the head of Port San Juan between the two main rivers that empty into the ocean. These waters are the foundation of Pachidat and Pachidat means people of the sea foam. And the governance of the marine territories is actively practiced. The territory runs about 192 kilometers of coastline from Sheringham Point to Vanilla Point, including Swiftshire Bank at the western entrance of the Juan de Fuca. We've been working on the recognition of marine territorial waters for many years and have been focused on advancing the transboundary 
jurisdiction with the Macaw Marine Affairs Office, as mentioned yesterday by Chad Bochak. And for the last number of years, I've been traveling into Macaw and spending time in Nia Bay and learning uh, both of the experiences that were discussed yesterday through marine, managing marine incidences and also the the capacity development and, and systems development for being able to respond and being included in that response from, from Macaw um, people. And uh, have always been really, really thankful for those opportunities to learn of, of the decades of work Macaw has done to advance that, that work. Um, so we've really, we've really sought to, to bring that to Canada and to bring that to Pachidot to be able to have a comprehensive view and, and plan and capacity to be able to respond to an incident in the Juan de Fuca Strait. Um, can't really stress how much we have learned by it being able to work together with Macaw and other tribes and nations on, on the reality of the emergency response in the Juan de Fuca today, there is a lot of work to do, um, especially around uh, the J buoy and the increasing risks at the J buoy from marine traffic expansion here in Canada and the major projects that are on the horizon. So I think wanting to start with a bit of background of the of the Coast Guard State, the Marine Safety Center, and the work with the Coast Guard, and how that evolved out of the consultation process with Trans Mountain back in 2013. And I think I'll just pause before before going into background and to say that the photo that's on the screen uh, in front of you all is a. Uh, the culmination of all the work that I'll be describing. And, and uh, it was a celebration that was held in, in June of the signing of the MOU. So I can explain that more, but I thought, I think it, uh, at least you have a picture of the territory up um, in front of you. And that's a picture of Fort San Juan. And we were standing on the, uh, the government dock um, at uh, the historic, um, it was a historic port of entry for Port Renfrew and was also a um, the entry point where there weren't any roads so all all traffic was done by water which was obviously how Pachidot was moving about uh, by canoe and through the ocean highway. Um, this dock was servicing all the goods and all the traffic and, and transportation from Victoria and transboundary across to Nia Bay. So it was a very important landmark uh, for Pachidot and for Port Renfrew. So that's that's just where the, the photo was taken today or in June that I'm showing today. So I'll take a minute to go back and back to 2013 to give a bit of history to the Marine Safety Center and the consultation process that was initiated through Trans Mountain. And we took a deep dive into the risks and that were being developed through different uh, studies and the learnings that were coming out of transboundary forums. One, one of those such forums that the Department of Ecology held in Bellingham and they were showcasing the work of the VITRA study, uh, the Vessel Traffic Risk Assessment Study um, that had clearly identified risks at the J buoy and increasing traffic uh, being speculated right on the horizon from Trans Mountain and otherwise. So we began to embark on this learning of the marine traffic system, the safety regime, legislation, uh, transboundary coordination, and very importantly, international governance. One of the biggest and most important capacity developments was finding the language, the right language to translate to Canada and to the Crown, the importance of the marine territorial waters to Pachidot people and the ownership of those waters. Historically, that ownership was fiercely guarded and protected. Wars were fought and the entrance to the Juan de Fuca was particularly important site. Geographically, I, I wish I had put a map up, but since we're all focusing on uh, 
on the waters, hopefully it's understood the entrance of the Juan de Fuca Strait uh, being that, that strategic site that was in the middle of major trade routes running north and south and east and west, everything coming into other territories and other jurisdictions that are present today in, in the Salish Sea and Vancouver, Seattle, all came through the entrance to the Juan de Fuca Strait. Everything running up and down North America was passing by there. So it was a very important site. So it became apparent in our, in our learning and capacity development uh, the picture on the West Coast and just a couple of, of quick bullets here that um, began to flesh out uh, one that was covered by the previous presentation oil spill response planning and and the state of the area response plan from Transport Canada. The, the uh, work being done in the Juan de Fuca planning by Canadian Coast Guard, the work being done by industry, so up in Canada, WCMRC and the GRS planning, and the lack thereof here on the West Coast and in the Juan de Fuca, um, which we still highlight today as, an, as a real gap of, of needing to, to put energy and resources into and, and doing that in a transboundary context to be able to be comprehensive. Also seeing the gaps of equipment for response, um, the training and ultimately how to deploy that in the event of an emergency through different contractual arrangements, whether with Canada or with industry. The management of, of the traffic at the entrance was also highlighted as an area of improvement, the, the, the management um, was moved from Tofino up to Prince Rupert. So there's a little bit uh, more disconnect and more miles of uh, oversight there. Also, what became apparent in our learnings was that the, there's a lack of communication infrastructure around on radio and, and we have no cell phone service out here. So our communication is very limited. But even on water, radio and radar is uh, compromised by a couple of identified dead zones. There's little enforcement and compliance. Um, and, you know, up until more recently, the Coast Guard station or Coast Guard presence from Canada was very limited. And we relied primarily on, on the resources in Mia Bay. So if you were out in the water and had an incident, um, whatever it may be and needed help, you were calling, calling the states um, and that persists today. And another very important piece um, of that learning through that consultation process was response times. And uh, Port Renfrew and Pachidot community laid outside of the thresholds of response time that were proposed by, by Canada and, and, and being improved upon through Trans Mountain. We were kind of in, in, a, in a gap um, of these two response time circles that were um, dictated on a map coming from Banfield and Victoria. So we knew there was a, a great, grave need for imp uh, improvement there. So I just give a bit of that history um, just in, in, in building into the development of the station. And that translation to Canada is ongoing, especially with many other major projects on the horizon. And those, those projects will dramatically impact the capacity of the shipping lanes, the risks, the cumulative effects, and the impacts on management. We're probably all familiar with them, but Roberts Bank, LNG, Delta Port, and others. So that kind of brings us into when Trans Mountain was first decided upon. Um, Canada had announced the OPP. I've heard that referenced a couple of times today. And uh, $1.5 billion, including four lifeboat stations. Um, and we were very excited about that news, but had to read about it. So I think that gives a good context of, of how far we've come with the station development. So it was originally a lifeboat station and went back to the drawing board with Trans Mountain consultation in 2018 and was announced through that um, consultation process that it would become 
more of the vision from Petit Dot with Canada on a Marine Safety Centre. And the vision there is to be able to increase that emergency response capacity across the border, also the oil spill response, ICS capacity, and increased safety demands for the region, I think now exasperated through the learnings that we've had through the, the pandemic. And uh, I guess just in, in being able to highlight the photo show, shown on your screen that the ceremony on June, June 30th was the signing of the MOU. And one of the principles in that MOU is, is consensus decision-making. And we were able to hold, host that event in, in the middle of the pandemic. And we were able to have the ceremony and, and to be able to dance together and celebrate with DT Dot, and I think that speaks very loudly of the success of the event and the success of, of the work being done with Coast Guard. So currently looking to the siting of the station, um, where the physical station is going to go in the territory, where the marine assets are going to go, and I think utilizing the Marine Safety Center as a cornerstone to close the gaps that I've been describing so I'll just close with a couple of, of recommendations, I think, um, in taking the Marine Safety Center and the success and trying to, to advance um, recommendations that can be housed through the Marine Safety Center work. Um, I think the, the work on the Can US PAC and, and being able to exercise out on the West Coast is, is one strong recommendation for years to come. Also using the Marine Safety Center as a, a catalyst for response planning on the West Coast. We'd also like to recommend coordination with Macaw and other tribes for equipment and response planning and be able to coordinate those resources. And I think most importantly, to be able to improve communication and process, perhaps through the dedicated transboundary coordinator or otherwise, but to really highlight that transboundary consistency through being able to, to centralize those resources. So I think my time is up, but I just wanted to, to say a big cleco, cleco to everyone and, and, and thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Christine, uh, for that. And the photo is just gorgeous. What a beautiful day for, for a ceremony like that. Um, please, I invite you, if you have any questions, to please enter that into the Q&A, and we're going to go ahead and get started on um, Linda Pilkey Jarvis's um, presentation. So, Linda, um, let me pull up your presentation. And you're good to go. I'm just gonna pop on and give a wave to everybody, say hello that way, and then turn my video off as well for the same reasons. So, um, uh, all right. Hey, hello everybody. It really is truly an honor to be here with you and to just spend these two days listening to so many amazing speakers. Um, I'm with the Department of, e of Ecology and I'm gonna talk about oil spill planning for resource protection um, in a transboundary environment. I'm focusing on an example from the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, so next slide, please, me. Um, a lot of people who are have been here for the last two days likely know about geographic response plans or GRPs. Um, they, they essentially are the content from a series of different planning documents that will get activated when oil spills occur. So GRPs uh, define pre-approved land-based booming strategies that are meant to help us minimize damages to natural, cultural, and economic resources. Uh, we, we like to say that they're the marching orders, um, you know, one of the, the first couple of priorities uh, in a spill response. And that's because they are pre-approved. So uh, we can begin resource protection without having any delays. They're also viewed, they should also be viewed as a communication tool though. 
So they give a glimpse into our plans for response um, and also give people an opportunity to shape that planning, which I think is so very important. So they're developed in trust, you might say, by agencies um, on behalf of communities. Next slide. This slide shows some of the things that we consider, the considerations that we use when we think when we think about how we're going to develop these um, these response tactics. So, for example, uh, we can't safely or or uh, feasibly uh, deploy boom everywhere um, because sometimes the conditions just uh, you know are prohibitive. So from a planning pers perspective, we may decide not to write a strategy to pr protect what we think of as a high value resource in these publications. But that doesn't preclude us um, from the, uh, however, on the day of a spill from trying something to protect that resource. So GRPs aren't everything. They're just the, the first, uh, first thing, some of the first things that will be done um, it, when a spill occurs. Next slide, me, please. <clears throat> this, this little graphic depicts um, all the places where we have uh, GRPs, geographic response plans in Washington. Um, it, you know, they may seem oddly spaced out, but what, what these plans are doing is closely following the transportation corridors for vessels, pipelines, and railroads. Um, this is where the risk of uh, larger spills exists. So it, you know, as we get around to develop them in, in all places that we can, um, we, we're, we're really following the places where you, you have the largest risk of spills. Next one, please. <clears throat> so our, our goal is to have a major update of these plans at least once every five years, but we do have the ability to have interim updates um, as needed. Uh, we, we now have sort of gained that um, ability to have that. Uh, we, we, <clears throat> in recent years, we've had a very big investment from the legislature in Washington. So for, for the first time, I can say that we um, are likely to be able to achieve the goal of, of, of the five years um, for updates. After the first set of GRPs were developed decades ago, they, they literally, uh, uh, a decade went by before uh, we were able to get around and update them again. So we're, we're in such a great place uh, with, the, with the recent investments. A lot of the filling in um, that you saw on that previous slide, uh, you know, the reason that we got the investments was to fill in in all the areas uh, where we, we're suddenly experiencing a lot of railroad movement of oil. So, you know, we're, we're in a really good place in, in the state of Washington right now for these plans. Next slide. <clears throat> so this, this is a snapshot of the Oil Spills 101 site. And this is where we post information about the GRPs. Uh, Ni nee talked about this site yesterday. Uh, for example, she mentioned that um, volunteers and vessels of opportunity can register here. So this is a multi-purpose site. And um, I really hope that people will take the time to uh, go take a look at, at this. So we, we have started, for instance, a new blog site um, that we're using to communicate about non-floating oil, the new non-floating oil changes to the GRPs, which we're, um, we're making right now. And I'm gonna touch on that again in a moment. Um, this is also the place where uh, we announce which GRPs are up for public comment and, and you can help us improve those plans through this site. Next slide. So this, this slide shows um, the new format that we are moving towards to develop these publications. Previously, we, we wrote GRPs um, formatted into a very long single document that was very labor intensive to complete. 
So um, through our uh, area planning process, we conducted a, a user survey after all of these many years of having GRPs. So we wanted to ask questions about accessibility to the plans and the content of the plans. So we were uh, looking for uh, efficiencies and best practices. And not surprising, we found that there's a range, a real range of ways that responders use GRPs. Uh, you know, we still have to retain the ability to uh, old school, just print them out on paper <laughs> because those get put onto uh, response trucks and, and boats and in offices uh, for people to quickly access. But we also have users who uh, want to access them through a more sophisticated, uh, you know, sp spatial planning programs and, and tools. So um, that helped us move towards uh, these changes here in this, this new formatting, which uh, you know, gives everybody the ability to, to uh, quickly use them the way that they need to use them. And um, you know, it, it, it's a lot less work for us to develop them. Next slide. So we're currently updating the Strait of Juan de Fuca Geographic Response Plan, GRP. Uh, this slide shows the cycle, the general cycle to uh, develop a GRP. So um, for this particular one, we've, we opened this in 2018 um, and have, a, have had a few fits and starts along the way, uh, which is a long story, uh, but we're still working on it. So we, the straight, you know, is, is the long area of, uh, that provides the outlet from the Salish Sea to the Pacific Ocean. And we all know that what is now the inter international boundary between Canada and the United States divides the strait. So uh, since 2018, uh, we, we've done a bunch of outreach and field work. That's sort of where we're at in this cycle right now um, to, to examine the plan that previously existed and you know find out uh, about the things that it it's lacking or the things that were no longer true so we need to make changes to the existing strategies the existing plan and we need to incorporate new things that we're learning about so we we spend a lot of time meeting with people with tribes and ports landowners or resource managers, um, all levels of government, local, state, and federal um, communities and advocacy groups um, to, to help us gather that information. Um, right now, we're pretty much paused uh, in this work be because of COVID, uh, although uh, some of our partners um, in this endeavor are uh, able to uh, keep conducting field work for us. So, so we have the uh, Jamestown Squalum tribe that currently are getting out into the field when they can with their staff and they're sending back data to our offices as they uh, complete their visits. So we are working um, even if we aren't able right now to be back out there. So following um, the process uh, uh, over the next few months, we'll be reviewing the old and the new data. We'll be doing some virtual meetings um, to continue the work. We'll be doing data entry. We'll have um, a period, uh, once there is a draft, we'll have a period of public comment um, that we will uh, go through before it finally gets published. And, and that will be done in some time um, next year. So next slide. So one of, one of the first steps in developing a GRP is to identify the potential spill risks. And so the strait being the uh, major marine transportation corridor is, is, is you know, co-located with uh, a, a lot of amazing and wonderful natural, cultural and economic resources. So it's the um, entrance to on the for the United States to a, a high volume port complex. Um, it's the entrance to some of Canada's largest ports, um, and and we also it's also an entrance for uh, one of the world's largest naval uh, complexes. 
Um, Port Angeles uh, itself is an active bunkering location um, for, for both US and Canadian vessels. And it has an oil storage terminal um, located there uh, for that purpose. Um, so, and then the other thing that we know historically is, is that there was a, a major oil spill um, in this area in the 1980s in Port Angeles itself. So, so we know how oil might act. Um, it's, it could be expected to leave the port and get out into the straits and, and wash back and forth. So next slide, please. Um, here, here's a partial example of what's in a GRP. So this is the area of Dungeness Spit. So this is from our existing plan. The orange symbol um, on this slide is, uh, we call that a spill origin point. So in order for us to be able to prioritize the order in which we want people to deploy the strategies, we have to start from a likely spill point. So we have picked that as a, a likely spill point, obviously from some kind of a vessel incident. The yellow boxes are the strategy locations. So that's how many strategies we've created around um, the spit. And so for each of those yellow boxes, there is a corresponding two page document that shows what the strategy is. It shows um, how much boom we want to deploy, at what angle, how to anchor it, um, talks about what you're protecting, um, gives you driving directions and safety precautions, um, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please, Nee. So this update that we're going under currently will include new information um, for protection from oils that uh, may not remain floating oils that may submerge or sink after they spill. That's the latest evolution in, in our tools on the US side. Um, on this slide, you'll see a list of oils that, <clears throat> that are transported in Washington that in, may inherently have properties that could lead to sinking. Um, but it's not just the oil that we need to consider, it's also the properties of the receiving water body. So this is a list, also a list of conditions that could lead to oil sinking or submerging. Next slide, please. So to update the GRPs, we've created a, a little bit of a tool to examine the water conditions um, and um, look for those areas where um, oil may, sinking oil may be a problem. And this is a draft analysis um, from this particular area. So this will be with this with the explanation for it will be going into the GRPs. Next slide, me please. Um, each GRP will also contain a table like this. This is for a different area. We haven't developed the one for the straits yet, but this table summarizes two things: um, the conditions that could lead to sinking or submerging oils, or um, I mean, as well as the considerations that would be relevant in um, at safely recovering sunken oil. So an example would be the known location for a, a sink, and that might be a place where we want to go and look for oil that may accumulate after it sinks. Um, and, a, uh, we, and it also, another example would be uh, safety hazards that we would communicate to responders, um, such as um, underwater cables. Okay, last slide. Um, so I'm gonna end with, with this slide, which is a, a picture that shows how Canada and the US have aligned our land-based planning. Um, this is really exciting progress for me personally. Um, you know, it's 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 something that for all the years that I've been working at the Department of Ecology, I, I have just wanted to be able to see this. So you can see the picture on the left hand side are the response strategies on the Canadian side, and the right hand side for the same area are the response strategies for the United States. So there's some slight differences and there's similarities. Um, between how the GRPs, as we call them, are created and the GRSs, the geographic response strategies are developed on the Canadian side. But this is truly great progress that uh, we now have both sides of that 
uh, the now international border uh, covered with compatible plans. So um, that's it. My, the last slide just has my contact information on it, but I, I just want to close by uh, giving thanks to uh, you, Ni, nee, for moderating this session and helping us with those slides. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Linda. And again, please, if you have any questions for Linda, please enter that in the um, uh, uh, Q&A feature. And we'll go ahead and get started with Todd's um, presentation. Todd, um, go ahead with your introduction and I'll start your slide. Okay. Aizquachil CM Nishalacha, Todd Woodard Senesnat, Wasa Amish Sen, Chilin Tixwa, Shichatongquin Atlong, Kwakwasan Wanidamken. So good day, all friends, colleagues, and relations. My name is Todd Woodard, and I work for the Samish Indian Nation. Specifically, I'm with the house that watches over all the territory, which is the name that's been given to our natural resources department. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more hyper locally than a lot of the talks today about what Samish is doing to try and prepare for and be part of a rapid, robust response in the event that there were a spill in our area of operations. Uh, next slide, please. So this is obviously an area that's been uh, talked about quite a bit over the last two days. This is generally our area of operations or Samish traditional territory, but certainly want just by the extent of that picture acknowledge that this is an area due to its natural resources and um, proximity is has been stewarded by and continues to be stewarded by a, a large number of US tribes and First Nations um, of Canada. So this is very much a, a shared territory and is going to be an area of big concern for a number of people should there be a large event in this area. Next slide, please. Also, many other people besides me have spoken very eloquently about cultural concerns and indigenous scientific knowledge in this area. And the whole next panel is going to be uh, uh, much more focused on that. So uh, suffice it to say that Samish, like other Coast Salish people, um, are rich in Chilangan culture, way of knowledge um, that has stretched back hundreds of generations and will continue to stretch forward for hundreds more. Next slide, please. So we've talked also before about a lot of the threat. Um, so we're looking at increased shipping traffic um, that's being projected. Ris we have risk here from all size vessels, small to large, um, not just the large container ships or oil transport, but I just got notified last night at the end of our session, as many of you probably did, of a sunken sailboat off of Lopez Island. Um, and so there's a lot of those small spills that can affect the area um, that is of cultural significance to tribal peoples as well. Um, like Swinomish, we also are headquartered in the Anacortes area. And so we've got the two major oil refineries on March's Point uh, and also not too far away from uh, those up in, in Bellingham area. Now, next slide, please. So our spill preparedness began back in about 2008 when we, real, we were only a department of three at Samish DNR. And we all of a sudden realized that if there was an event in our area, we wouldn't even be allowed on tribally owned beaches uh, unless we had HAZWOPR certification. And that was a major concern because how could we represent the tribe's interests if we couldn't even get onto the lands that might be impacted by a spill. Um, so we start, we hosted a 24 hour Haswapper class for tribal spill responders and had representatives from other, or uh, participants from other tribes. Currently that now cap capacity is built to all seven members of the Samish DNR staff maintaining a Haswapper certification uh, at all times. We've also received training in ephemeral data collection and have a kit, uh, six go kits ready to go so that we could get out ahead of a spill and gain valuable environmental data that would be used in the NERDA natural resource damage assessment process during a spill. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also started participating in spill drills with both the Shell and the Tesoro uh, refineries in, on March's Point. Um, this was very much uh, my first experience uh, several years ago with ICS and a whole new list of acronyms. Um, but Having participated over a number of years now, um, we've played at a number of different levels, all the way to tribal on-scene coordinator uh, and down to the environmental desk and uh, communications, et cetera. 
Um, so that's been valuable experience. Um, and also, again, letting folks get to know each other before the event of a spill. I like to think of it as having the door being open and partnerships formed so that if there were a spill, uh, the tribes wouldn't have to kick down the door to get to those tables. And I think that's really important. Next slide, please. We have also recently um, acquired a 26 foot landing class or landing craft, Yamich, uh, Chinook. And that was purchased through Ecology's Spill Response Program uh, grant. Um, and that has really increased our capacity um, to assist in that robust and rapid response. We also didn't want to replicate capabilities that were already in the area. So for example, Swinomish and Lummi have very robust programs and boom uh, and equipment caches uh, that they're capable of deploying. So we didn't want to replicate that capability. So what we decided to do was work with Ecology and we're currently developing an MOU with the spill response community at Ecology so that we could be first call transport throughout the San Juans in the event of a, a, a spill responder needing to go to a, a, lo a specific location. So they'd pick up the phone and call us first and we would do our utmost to try and get them out to where they needed to be. Um, unfortunately, due to the budget hits from COVID that MOU has had to be put on hold um, as there's uh, the state cannot enter into new contracts at this time. Um, but we're ready to stand by when that frees up again. We would also be dedicated uh, transport for NERDA staff in the event of a larger spill in the areas to get them where they needed to go. Um, and we're also working with Focus Wildlife, which is a, uh, one of the preeminent oiled wildlife response groups so that we could be transporting um, you know, oiled wildlife to a specific location uh, based on their needs. And then if those two responsibilities were done, we would become a tier two VU and, uh, and fill in wherever we, we could. Uh, next slide, please. So while we are really looking at local things, um, we are also trying to engage at levels higher up as well. So we have participated in the GRP updates for uh, both the North Sound and San Juan areas. Um, and that was really great. We had uh, uh, GRP folks out to our office and sat down with some of our cultural folks and our tribal historic preservation officer. And we're able to identify some specific areas of concern. Um, the original GRP actually one of the very first uh, deployments would be to protect cultural concerns. Uh, in the area around the refineries that Samish has identified. And we were able to look at uh, a broader um, area around the San Juans to assist in identifying areas. And I think the, the really neat thing that I've seen evolve over the years is that we don't have to identify why those areas are culturally significant. All we had to do was say they are culturally significant. And then that was taken at face value and GRPs are being developed to help protect those areas. And I think that's a really good balance between the partnership and sharing of information while protecting uh, culturally sensitive information as well. Um, we also do our best on policy levels to try and track on things that'll impact our area of operations. So for example, several years ago, um, the Department of Commerce proposed to designate the Sailor Sea as a marine highway um, and one of their selling points was that it would move commerce off the rail and off the roads and into the Salish Sea. And Samish, along with a number of tribes, commented against that um, as being detrimental to the natural resources significant to the tribes. And so that proposal was actually withdrawn based on that comment. Um, and we also participate on the governor's orca or participated on the orca, uh, orca recovery task force. Um, and are active in trying to look at impacts of vessel traffic um, on specifically JPOD. Next slide. Um, again, I think I already sort of covered this that we're trying to uh, to occupy, you know, in the event of a, of a response at the refineries, we would occupy different levels at ICS to spread resources from other tribes that would likely respond. I've recently spent quite a bit of time in the liaison office and really trying to work with the refineries and state and federal um, folks to help them understand that, especially in the islands, it's not going to be one or two tribes that show up at the door in the event of a spill. It's going to be a minimum of seven U.S. tribes. And then within 48 hours, there's going to be a lot of First Nations and Canadian concerns that, um, that will start banging on the door as well. 
So I've tried to work with them and I think there's growing momentum to understand that there needs to be tribally specific messages crafted and brought out. There has to be a very clear path to have tribal concerns come in to unified command and be acted on and then very clear communication coming out of unified command that is uh, specific to indigenous populations. And I think if we're talking about sort of things that are, are missing, um, you can go to the next slide, that's fine. Um, one of the things that I think tribes need to do is really coordinate with each other because even though ICS says there can be as many tribal on-scene coordinators as possible, having seven, 10, 12 of those tribal on-scene coordinators seems uh, very difficult. So I think tribes can work together in these areas to try and identify the right process to get information in and out um, more efficiently. So our goal is obviously uh, prevention first, but Samish also wants to be part, uh, a valuable part of any uh, response that's needed. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, that's the last one. So that's how Samish is uh, working to try and contribute to this effort and uh, hopefully it can provide an example to other tribes and First Nations that may be trying to embark on this. I think um, it's also very important to understand that again, Samish DNR is a department of seven people Oil spill response is a very small part of our overall mission statement. Um, and so it's very hard. I could spend probably all year going to different response events and different meetings, but um, most of our oil spill work is uh, not directly funded. So we try and cobble it together as we can. And um, I think it's very important for folks to know that um, lack of participation does not necessarily mean lack of interest or does not at all mean lack of interest by the tribes, but it means that we have a lack of capacity to spread ourselves um, across every area of concern for the people that we work for. Um, so I will end it there and uh, happily be part of the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Todd. And I uh, do want to echo um, the uh, sentiment about drills. It has been so valuable and has enriched everyone's experience when tribes are able to participate in drills, the information exchange, um, you know, everything that, that that participation, getting to know each other, all of those things are super important. So um, I hope that after COVID, or at least when we figure out how to do these things a little bit more virtually that um, we'll get more participation and consistent. So thank you so much. Um, I think we're gonna be able to share some of these presentations. So contact information will be available, but I just wanted to say thank you so much to Jillian, uh, to Christine, Linda and Todd for some great information um, that they've made available here. Um, a lot of work is being done, uh, more work needs to be done, um, but the dialogue is there, the plan is there. So uh, we're moving forward, we're progressing. So thank you. Thank you so much, me for moderating. And thank you to uh, Jillian, Linda, Todd, and Christine for your great presentations. Um, so we're on break and we will come back.